My name is Michelle Dejanet, and I will be your moderator uh, for today. And today's topic is um, estate planning, um, avoiding, I'm um, sorry, estate planning. Yes, you can do it to court accounting. Um, your speaker for today will be Rex Crandall, and I will tell you a little bit about Rex. Um, he is a principal at the law office of Rex L. Crandall and is also a principal at Rex L. Crandall, an accountancy corporation. Mr. Crandall is an attorney with 14 years of experience in Northern California who specializes in estate planning, estate administration, wills, trusts, durable power of attorneys, advanced health care directives, special needs trusts, and probate law for individuals and families in the East Bay area. Mr. Crandall has over 40 years of experience in providing extensive income tax preparation, consulting, and legal guidance to individuals, families, businesses of all sizes, partnerships, corporations, limited liability companies, estate and trust fiduciary tax clients, non-resident alien returns, USA owners of domestic and foreign corporations, and foreign real estate and disregarded business entities. Whew. Additionally, Mr. Crandall has experience in real estate transactions since 1979 and has held a California real estate broker license for many years. Over the course of his career, Mr. Crandall has represented taxpayers before the Internal Revenue Service, U.S. Tax Court, Franchise Tax Board, and Employment Development Department. Uh, Mr. Crandall is a frequent lecturer to various civic, social, and professional organizations on the topics of income taxation, financial, um, and estate planning. So I would like to welcome you guys um, to this um, um, this portion of the conference. Uh, just a little reminder, if you have any questions, please make sure that you put them in the, um, in the, in the Q&A section. And if they're pertinent um, as we're going along the discussion uh, in, in the presentation, um, Mr. Crandall uh, will uh, go ahead and, um, and, and we'll address those at the time. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, here is Mr. Rex Crandall. Okay, thank you, Michelle, for that introduction. It, it was uh, quite nice. I was uh, had to pinch myself to make sure it wasn't a eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm here. So, greetings, everyone. I don't have any images of any of the participants today, so that's fine, but I will take questions during the presentation. You can write them in the chat. The uh, topic says EP, yes, you can do this too. Court accounting for guardianships, conservators, probate cases, and trusts. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to address some pieces of that title. And what we're doing is doing court accounting because it's required for guardianships, conservators, and probates. And it's optional to have your court accounting approved by the judge um, for trusts. You can always force a trust to do an accounting and then it's required. In terms of addressing what it says, yes, you can do this too. What I'm taking that to mean is there's a supposition that you're an LDA and that you can add this to your LLs, your LDA services. Um, I happen also to be an LDA, a CPA, an attorney, and an EA and other things. But one thing I wanted to point out is that in doing the actual court accounting, no license is required at all. It's basically bookkeeping and California does not have a requirement that anyone have a license to do bookkeeping. And what 
we teach this class too frequently, we give it every other month for the Contra Costa Public Law Library, are people who are self-represented in uh, conservatorship cases, other types of cases. But there's two parts of the court accounting. One is working with the numbers and doing the report. Okay, that's the transactional side. And then the other side of it is a petition for approval of the court. So for guardianships, conservators, and probate, you must turn in your accounting, it's required, and to be approved by the court. So in that regard, preparing the petition along with the accounting, I do feel that an LDA license would be appropriate LDA or law firm to prepare the petition explaining what has happened uh, over the time period that the person um, has been in charge of someone else's money. And that's the whole essence of where we start with the court accounting is that someone is in charge of someone else's money. So we have court supervision to provide oversight and a mechanism in case there's any problems. Um, I kind of joke around that cash and money sometimes grows legs and walks off. Uh, unfortunately, that happens. So uh, the court supervision is uh, sometimes necessary um, and also required by statutes. So the way I'm going to present the class today is work on the transactional side, the numbers, and then if we have time, I'll very briefly cover the petition that you submit with the court accounting to the judge for approval. And normally that section, the petition, is an hour and a half long presentation by itself, so I'll have to speed through it. Um, if we have time. So what I have in front of you here is a section of the book called, guess what, Handbook for Conservators. The way I put this together is I took sections out that had to do with accounting. It's approved by Judicial Council. And all my page numbers here are in the lower left. And if you want the entire book, this handbook for conservators in your material, there's the link that you can obtain the book and it's about 120 pages. So um, I'm gonna skip ahead to the transactional side. Where are we here? Here. Okay, so in the accounting, the overall time view of the court accounting is you start out with a certain amount of money or assets and just simply put what do you got and then the interim report is what happened to the transactions and then the ending part of the report is what do you have left now and those concepts are, are borne out by these forms. So in the, um, the main form we have, these are all judicial counsel forms and they are available online free download from the courts. And this particular one, I wanted to point out to everyone, these are not our page numbers, okay? These are the form numbers. So this particular form is a GC 400 sum. And it's the summary of the accounts and your entire account transaction report revolves around this. And I point out in the lower left of the form that it's a mandatory form. According to the Judicial Council, who is the equivalent to the board of directors for the California Supreme Court. So this form is, is a required form for court accounting for probate, guardianships, and conservatorships. 
and it's optional for trusts. But the format for trust is the same. Okay, so when you're starting to fill out the form, you need to say whether you're guardianship, conservatorship, and if you're a probate, you should put right in probate, and if it's a trust, write in trust here. On each page, you have to have your case number that has already been filed, and you end up naming your account in sequence. If somebody's been a guardian for or conservator for 10 years, this might be their fifth accounting. So you have to show the time period. When does it start and when does it end? It's usually a one year time frame. And the beginning date is the date you got what's called letters. So letters are when you are appointed as guardian or appointed as executor administrator for one year later. The way it works for guardianships, conservators and probates is when you get your letters, in this case, March 8th, you have 90 days to file what's called an inventory and appraisal. So you have to tell the court within 90 days what assets you have available that you're managing and you have to get every one of them appraised if they're not cash. So in a probate, a lot of times we'll have a first and final if the probate goes that quick. Um, we can go along that uh, and just do one and we're done with it. Now, the form, this form is broken into two parts, charges and credits. So inbound or assets on hand and inbound money or assets, credits are outbound, either payments or distributions to beneficiaries or something like that, and then what you're left over with. Okay, so as I said, at, at the end of the first 90 days, you have to file an inventory and appraisal. It's a separate form that we can talk about later. And from that inventory and appraisal, you have these assets that were shown and they need to match what you reported originally. So those numbers are just to carry uh, carried from the prior forms. Um, there's what I consider arcane language. You know, I came up through CPA school and this is nothing to do with debits and credits. It's completely outside of anything that anyone learns in accounting school. It, this is strictly a creature of the California statutes. So the first terms that we're gonna define here are charges and credits. Charges, to me, it sounds like you're using your credit card and charging some, but it doesn't mean that. You can translate that to responsibility. So you're handling someone else's money you're charged with that responsibility to handle that money and do appropriate things with it. So that's what they mean in this term, charges. And then credits is a term when the funds or assets were properly distributed. So you can look at the credit section as a discharge of responsibility to get the fiduciary. A fiduciary is like a trustee, guardian, or conservator. It's a generic term, fiduciary, one size fits all. Anybody else who's handling money or an action for another person is a fiduciary. The first, another term that you'll have to know and use 
in court accounting is a term called carry value. And what that means is what were the assets appraised at when you got your letters, when you were appointed? So cash and you know CDs and things like that, they all just, you just read the value of the statement on the date you're appointed. Non-cash, we have a probate referee that has to appraise them and that you have a series of assets that you're in charge of and that carry value will follow the entire accounting no matter how long it goes. In 10, 20 years, there'll be beginning carry value and it does not change based on market fluctuations. So that's a term, in regular accounting, it would be called basis, if anybody knows anything about tax or regular accounting, but they don't use the term basis, that's not used here at all. Um, another thing I wanted to point out was, some people think that when you do court accounting, you can just give it to a tax person and they can do the fiduciary tax returns uh, for a probate, let's say, or a trust. And that's not the case. Whenever a trust or probate estate has over $600 of income during a year, it must file a fiduciary tax return, Form 1041, and California Form 541. But it's on a completely different legislative basis. You're, let's say that this was income and disbursements and you just can't take these numbers and put them on a tax return because tax is, has completely different uh, usage. For example, a distribution to a beneficiary, it's a reduction here as a credit and it, and it relieves you of responsibility for those assets. But on tax, there's no deduction. You don't get any write-off from giving distributions. Anyway, I don't want to get too bogged down in terminology, but I did want you to get some idea on how it works. Um, the form goes through, and we're going to go through several parts. And still in the overview, you'll see the charges and the credits. And they have to balance. It's not quite what an accounting balance sheet is, but if you don't, the, the money you have available that came in and that went out, if it doesn't balance, you're not done yet. It'll never get past the probate examiners who are the first people to look at all uh, court accounting. So it has to balance. And unfortunately, I mean, with IRS, they allow us to round to the nearest dollar. They don't even want pennies anymore. But court accounting is a little uh, antiquated and you have to account for every penny. It's just the way it works. So we have several sections here by categories and there's details underneath each of these categories. We're gonna go through and look at the schedules in a moment on, okay, so this is what we started with what came in. So we get, if we got additional property, let's say somebody made a donation to the, the ward. We, um, the term ward is frequently used in guardianship and conservator cases when somebody's alive but doesn't have capacity, let's say Alzheimer's, or for example, if they're a minor, uh, the term ward is used to describe the person. And that's how the term ward of the court came about. And uh, if someone had given assets to the ward, then it would come in here under additional property receipt. Uh, receipts during the account, we're going to go into that during in, in great detail. It could be income, dividends, interest, pension, could be a variety of things. Uh, gains on sales, when you sell stuff, and that's a gain from carry value. It's not a tax concept. 
And then uh, other charges, you can add additional schedules. And one of the things I am glad that if the ward or the conservatee owns a business, that the court accounting excludes all of the transactions from the business. So if the business has an accountant and they do an income statement and there's a net income number, that's all you have to turn into the court is what that net income number is, which saves untold hours of work. So, and then we're going through the form and now we start getting into the outbound money being dispersed. So disbursements, we have a variety of schedules for that. Uh, losses during the sale, that would be the sale of assets that were sold at less than carry value. Uh, distributions, here's that word again, conservative or ward. Uh, frequently the award will get a certain amount of uh, cash each month for their own purchases. Other credits, other money going out losses from a business. And then we get into the ending numbers for how much cash is left and the value of the assets at carry value at the end of the time period. And then these two numbers, line seven and line 14 must balance. So, what we have is from a time perspective, when we start out, what do you have? What are you responsible for? What came in during the months in between the year? And then what's left over at the end? Um, this form says it's summary of account. It's um, in software, they call this like a dashboard that you have to go back and forth through. Um, in, I use a, drive, a driving analogy on this GC400 sum that it's like your steering wheel in a court accounting. Everything goes through this form on every transaction on court accounting. And we're going to be talking about a standard account. I will just define what it is. There is what's called a simplified account. And I won't do them, but if somebody, let's say there was a guardianship or conservatorship and the ward had 12 transactions during the year, well, the court will allow you just to list them in chronological order. And that would be referred to as a simplified account, but you still don't get away from having to fill out this form. It's, it's required on simplified accounts too. Right. Another distinction with this form, oftentimes people get used to just leaving a line blank, but this is the court. They want a commitment from the person preparing it that it's zero. It isn't, I just forgot it. it that you're committed when you put the zero on each of the lines and, and it is required. Another feature of judicial counsel forms is in the lower right, they give you references to codes, codes and rules of court that explain the statutory basis for this form. Not all of it, but a good deal of it. I call this like a breadcrumb trail. So, if you said, I don't understand what I got to do this for, how come that, and what do they mean by this word? You can go to the probate code and beginning for court accounting starts on probate code section 1060. And then they give you a couple other code sections. And you also end up, you can go to the, pull up the California rules of court on internet search and read about it. My assistant, Cameron Brown, who helps teach this class frequently, says, oh, that's, yeah, you put that in there. Nobody's going to want to do that. It's too complicated. Yeah, if you want to look at it, go ahead. It's not required, but those who are curious, it is additional information. So if you have 
printed out this form in terms of from the packet of uh, class material. If it's all printed out, I suggest you dog ear this page. Um, on my screen, it looks like page 23 because we are going to go back and forth to this form all the way through this class. So make it easy to get back to it. So we're going to start this. This is a beginning asset. So let me put it in context. You were appointed guardian conservator or, or executor administrator. Nine months after you were appointed, you have to do an inventory and appraisal and tell the court what you have. And then at the end of the year, you have to do an accounting. So for guardianships and conservatorships, 90 days inventory appraisal. The end of a year, when the year goes by, you have to do your first accounting and submit it to the court for approval. Now, you don't have to do an accounting every year as a guardian or conservator. Most probates, the judge wants an accounting every year, but it's not statutory. Um, so when you're guardian or conservator, at the end of the first year, you do the first account, and then you do another account every other year after that. So numerically, it's you do the accounting at the year one, year three, year five, year seven, year nine, and you're always including two years worth of data. So in the detail of cash on the beginning, this one, cash in the beginning of the account period, you would list that same data that you had on your inventory and appraisal, you already turned into the court, but they want this. Um, you'll notice this is page PH. So there are about 48 different court accounting forms that the Judicial Council has made available. And unfortunately, I think their numbering system could have been less uh, cumbersome. But all of these are GC 400. And then there's a little letter here. And um, the GC stands for guardianship and conservatorships in case anybody, anybody wanted. So assets on the beginning of the period. And another thing I, I wanted to point out because I get this come up once in a while is let's say you have a family member who's incapacitated. Let's say they get Alzheimer's, they have to go to a skilled nursing facility. And now to get access to any of their funds, the well spouse has to get a conservatorship because they did not do proper estate planning. If you do proper estate planning and you have a trust, a will, a durable power of attorney asset management, the durable power of asset management, when somebody becomes incapacitated, the successor attorney, in fact, automatically takes over and can manage the assets, pay the bills. So that's the best way to do it. But somebody has to have an estate plan in order for that to work. When you don't have an estate plan, it's a lot more costly to handle the funds for an incapacitated family member. You have to go to court and get a conservatorship. So there's filing fees, annual fees, and uh, plus the court accounting. If you have a durable power of attorney for asset management and the person becomes incapacitated, you are not required to turn in a court accounting every year. So, it's good and saves money having an estate plan. But what I was trying to get to had to do with community property. So I was just on a case where somebody wanted court accounting done and it was a husband and wife. They've been married 35 years. 
They only had children from that marriage and every asset that they had was community property. And they wanted to put all that community property on the court accounting because one spouse was incapacitated and it's not right because there's a statute, probate code 3051, that says if one spouse is managing the community property assets and who is competent, they can manage and manage all the assets for the incapacitated spouse. So none of the community property be, would be listed on the court accounting. And essentially you wouldn't have one because there's nothing to account for. It's all community property. So if that comes up, it saves a lot of time, effort, and money if you can get out of the court accounting because of community property. Okay, so we're still at the beginning of the account period. Now we're going to bring in the uh, non-cash assets that were appraised when you got appointed by the judge to be guardian or conservator or executor. And you will bring in that carry value that you originally had the appraisals done for. And this is all at the beginning of the account period. So that means when you were appointed. And so the first account that you do, this form asks for an estimated market value. Well, when you got appointed, carry value by definition was the estimated market value. So you would not put in an estimated market value in your first account. And the instructions um, go over that in detail. Um, one little helpful technique that people who have never done this before say, well, what if I forget what you said? What did you say about this? What did you say about that? The forms themselves, if you have a question, read the form. You'll be surprised at how often it will answer the question. So it, it just, you have a backup system. So now we have all the assets at the beginning of the account, and that was listed on our beginning inventory and appraisal. These assets here are what we just spoke about. Okay. Now, moving on to the next section. This is an optional form. And the way the court accounting works is there's a variety of subschedules, kind of like an organizational chart that all lead up to a top sheet. And that top sheet is the GC 400 sum. But I like using this as an intermediate step because it summarizes all the subschedules before it gets to the GC 400 summary sum. And if this form is not attached and I'm reviewing someone else's work, I would have to go into all of the subschedules and add them up to make sure that they came forward properly into the summary. So I like using this form. It helps the reviewer. It says, don't file it with the court. I've never heard of anybody getting shot because they did turn it in. It's a minor point. So now we get into the receipts section. And so we're dealing with receipts. This is money coming in, dividends from, let's say, a mutual fund or from stocks you own. And you have to list every transaction. You cannot summarize a quarter, a month, a half year. Every transaction has to be indicated and listed. And I would separate it by types of investments. I mean, 
yeah, you could have a Schwab account and list all the dividends, yes. Um, if you own the stocks outright, I would put it by the uh, stock name. It just has to be understandable to the reader and in chronological order. So, and it even requires show dividends from each security separately. Okay. So we're in a group of forms called Schedule A. And this one is A1, Schedule A receipts, standard account. And down here in the corner is a tabulation section where this is schedule page A1, and we have six of the A series. And one thing you don't wanna do is accumulate numbers. Each page gets totaled on its own. It's not brought forward. And if you bring it forward, your numbers will be so far out of balance. It'll be amazing. So, we move on into another, another Schedule A, but this one happens to be A2, a big distinction, for receipts of interest. So anytime you get interest income, put the uh, each item from your statements there. And I was talking about, like this is page two of six, you put that it's a subtotal. Also reinforces what I was saying about um, not accumulating the numbers at the bottom of each page and bringing it to the next page. Um, whenever you're doing a court accounting and all, all your transactions and receipts and things, I suggest you use six digit dates because it gets confusing when six digit dates are not being used. And I think people get used to using four digit dates from when they're going through school because each school year doesn't matter one year and then next year you're going to have a different teacher. So they get used to four digit dates and they get into the habit. And then when they get out into the business and economic world, it can cause problems. For example, I had an IRS audit with a salesman who got audited on his travel and entertainment expenses. He brought in a pile of entertainment receipts, restaurant receipts and everything. And it, it was fairly extensive group of receipts, stubs, you know. But every one of them was four digit dates. And I don't know what the IRS thought, but I was thinking, what does this guy do? Just collect them every year and make his pile bigger? Because none of them gave reference to any of the the dates, and that includes putting the six digit dates in check registers. Okay. So the lower left is the page numbers that I'm using. We're going on to page 25 now. Uh, receipts. This has to do with pensions, annuities. You just list the item and uh, put the amount that was received in each of the transactions. So it, it, a lot of this is a copy job from the statements. You cannot just turn in the statements and say, I'm done. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so now we're on A4 for receipts, schedule A series, but rents. Okay, so I would put each property separately and list the rent received from each if there were more than one property. I would describe it also a single family home, a condo, a hundred unit apartment building, a fourplex, just so that it's in context <clears throat> with the amount of money that is being received. Um, and this says rents. Okay, so if the person has what I'll call a business, it does not go here. For example, if somebody has an Airbnb 
or a bed and breakfast or a hotel. That's not rental income. That's business income. And you have to use a business schedule, not uh, this one that, that describes rent. Okay, moving on to page 27. Social Security payments. Okay, so we've got Social Security. Right now, Social Security will only make direct deposit into your bank account. Um, but there's a problem on this page. It'll never get approved by the court. It says it's Social Security received for every quarter. You cannot combine payments into a summary, you have to list every check that came in. And the next concept I want to mention is netting, N-E-T-T-I-N-G. And for that, I'll go back to the rental schedule. So let's say the rent on the unit was 2,500, as it says, and the tenant wanted to fix the back porch and said, carpenter and said, I'll fix the back porch for $300. So the tenant only turned in $2,200 in rent. That is a net transactions and you can't do it. You have to show the full value of the rent as income. And then on the barter expense that has to show as a disbursement, you know, barter for the, uh, the unit. So that is netting. Now I'm gonna show you here something that sounds very similar to it, but it's different. <laughs> That's kind of an oxymoron. Um, so in like, just say for payroll, for example, this happens to be social security, they withhold money at the source. So when you're doing court accounting, you only have to do accounting for what you received. And the fact that a vendor, a pension company or social security held money out for a different purpose, that's not considering netting, that's the only amount of money you have. So, and then it's up for the tax people to wait till the 1099 SSA comes at the end of the year to match up what was taken out for Medicare payments. Okay, so we're on schedule page A506. We're making progress, it may not seem like it, but we are. Okay, so receipts, other, um, I translate that to miscellaneous. Everything else that didn't fit on another schedule, all kinds of unusual things, state tax refund, insurance reimbursement, Medicare refund, any kind of other miscellaneous transaction that we receive. And now we're on to gains on sales. So on gains on sales, you compare what the carry value was, which means what it was appraised for when you got your letters. And then when the property was sold sometime later, the difference would be considered a gain. But in my book, that is not the gain. If you have a house you just sold for 250,000 and it was worth 230 market value when you bought it, that gain is not 19,100. And the reason why you have about 4% of the sales price taken up or more in uh, closing costs, but you have to ignore the closing cost. This is the gross sales price. This is the net, the equal, after the equal sign of carry value minus sales price at gross equals the net gain. Okay, we'll call it gain. I don't agree with it, but who am I? I'm not the court. Um, now we're in a series of income forms, page B, one of one. So we're done with the B series. Now, instead of inflow, we're going to start dealing with outflow from disbursements. 
and we're on the GC 400 series, Schedule C. C starts for the disbursements on Form 2. So let's say the person's in a acute care facility and they have costs every month, you would just list those costs from the statement. And it's amazing what people have to pay for care homes. Five, 6,000 a month. We have one client that paid 150,000 for home care last year. It, uh, it doesn't pay to be sick. Okay, so we just list the amount of money that went out. And now for other disbursements, we're basically looking at, uh, this is a miscellaneous type, uh, disbursements, general administrative, medical, court, uh, attorney fees. Oh, in um, court accounting with probate fees for the executor, probate fees for the attorney, guardianship, so a, a guardian, or a conservator who's handling someone else's money cannot get paid at all until the judge signs an order that says they get paid. So as part of the annual or every other year accounting that fiduciaries have to do is write out to the court in the petition how much money they should be paid for their services during that time period. But if, uh, just say simply, if, you, if anybody takes out any money for those kind of services before the court approval, they will hear about it later. But that is not to say that you can't pay for bookkeepers, for doctors, other things. We're just talking about people who are representing the estate in a capacity where they're also handling money. So living expenses and anybody that does tax, you'd never see anything like this, living expenses. Um, because, but in a, in a conservatorship, the money's going out and it's a valid purpose to take care of the conservatee. Now, some of the things that, or suggestions that you do, if you have a disbursement that looks unusual, describe it because you can avoid problems when your accounting's turned in by not confusing uh, what the disbursement was for. Let's say you have uh, a, a person in a care home, they have very limited capacity, and then you have a trip to Disneyland here and $850. Well, if you don't describe it, you're probably gonna get a probate examiner note saying, what's this for? Was this for the, the guardian to go have a good time? So you describe it and say, took Ward to Disneyland with their family for four days. And explain, always explain how it benefits the Ward. Okay. Disbursements for medical, just list them. Um, when I was going through this accounting first time, I was looking at all these check numbers and I go, what's this T for? I didn't, anyway, I finally concluded it probably meant that they had a temporary check um, until the real checks came. For um, probates, and trust after a person passes away, you have to get a federal ID number. And then the bank will open an account for the probate estate or the trust. Without that ID number, you're not 
you, the, the social security number of a decedent can never be used after death. That's the end of it. And from then on, everything is done in a federal ID number. If you end up having to deal with the IRS, and you, you say, I've got letters, say I'm the guardian, uh, IRS has their own forms and they're probably not going to recognize it. Um, there is a form, Form 2848, which is a power of attorney form for IRS. And also there's a form, IRS Form 56, to tell the IRS that you are um, in charge of the finances for the ward. Okay, disbursements continued. Here's property sales expenses. Okay, this is what I was complaining about before that I didn't agree with the numbers. So that income number that we previously talked about again now gets knocked down extensively by the escrow closing costs. And when you're doing these uh, reports, always make sure you have the final closing statement, not a preliminary closing statement, because they frequently get turned in, but you can't process them because you don't know if other things were amended before the final escrow closing was uh, issued. So there, I had mentioned on the lower left of the forms that there are always code sections. And you may have a question that comes up when you get unusual kinds of transactions. And where do you look it up? Yeah, you could call me and ask. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another thing that you can do is, I don't know if you can see this book very well with all the background stuff. It looks like it's fading out. But uh, what it is, it's Fiduciary Accounting Handbook. <laughs> it's disappearing in the tech. Oh, boy. Anyway, Fiduciary Handbook, it's issued by CEB, Continuing Education of the Bar. And it was written by Margaret Hand and um, two other people. One was a, a judge and the other was Heather Hamilton. But it's a reference book that is the only reference book that I know about for California court accounting. So you can look up unusual things, uh, unusual transactions. And... Um, so I point that out. It's not cheap. Um, you can go to ceb.com, but last time I got one, it was over $200 and it's over 400 pages. Another reference book that I want to tell you about to look things up is probate referees do the appraisals on anything that's not cash for court accounting. And the California Association of Probate Referees has a booklet that's probably 80 or more pages that has a summary of all the rules that the, the appraisers, the probate referees have, have to follow. And it's another good resource to find out how things should be reported in a court account. Disbursements, okay, so we have a consignment sale, fine. Basically, you're gonna categorize every disbursement that happens. Okay, so we've got loan payments. This is a loan payment, you notice it's not broken down by principal and interest, it is just the loan payment. The principal and interest can be handled later on the tax returns. Okay, disbursements, other expenses, paying taxes, income tax preparation, other disbursements, losses on sale. 
the uh, losses on sale, we go back to carry value. And what did you actually sell it for? And none of the costs are, are listed there. Okay. So, um, Sometimes when you have assets and you're handling someone else's assets, you have to make decisions to that make sense. And one example, we had a situation where a guy had uh, was incapacitated and had a horse. And so the conservator had this horse and all this cost related to the horse and the ward was never going to ride the horse again well it makes sense to to get rid of the horse so that it reduces the expenses to the estate um the estate assets Even real quick rex yes hi um someone needs you to repeat the name of the reference books okay sure it's called very simply Fiduciary Accounting Handbook by CEB, Continuing Education of the Bar. They're in Oakland. And their website, ceb.com. Their phone number is 800-232-3444. So that's one of the two reference books. This one you can buy. And, the, and don't think you're going to get this book and learn court accounting from it. Way too technical. Won't happen. Uh, the other reference book that I mentioned was the Probate Referee Association Handbook that's available free online. Okay. Now we're... Um, out of the disbursements and we have at the end of the account period we have to list all of the cash accounts and what we do is we only use the last four digits of the accounts the bank accounts because these court files are available to the public and for identity theft purposes, I think it's better um, to only show the last four digits. Uh, same thing with social security numbers and other things. So this is reconciled to the end of the account period. And the other thing we have at the end of the account period is the carry value. That's the same that we had always. So that doesn't change. The beginning and ending are the same. However, at this point, it's a good idea to put the market value for a couple reasons. One is if an executor or trustee is managing someone else's money and they have, they have securities, investments, they may have an investment um, policy that's extremely risky that's caused a large loss in the portfolio. So by the um, turning in the value of the portfolio each time, then it allows the, um, the fiduciary to be relieved of liability if the beneficiaries don't object. And another thing, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that Trusts do not have to have court accounting. They're not required to report to the court. However, it's a common technique if you're administering an estate and there are beneficiaries who are quite likely going to litigate against the trustee. One technique is to have the trustee do a court accounting, submit it to the court for approval. And after the judge approves the court accounting, then the beneficiaries can no longer sue the trustee for mismanagement for the assets that were approved in the account. 
And that's because the beneficiary had a chance to object and they didn't, so they lose that right. So I need to go back to the summary, which is page 23 in my PDFs. And in the handout, the page, actual page number is 21. So we went through all the disbursements and we listed them. And he, these are the summaries of the transactions. Another thing that I do, just because I learned it in accounting school, was um, I, I always, since I started before the computers, I always run a tape of all my numbers, adding things up. And people say, well, you can't even buy an adding machine anymore. But the concept is the same. And that is every time, like say you're doing a computer adding of a series of numbers. Every time you do that, look at the screen and compare the numbers that you just keyed in compared to what it showed on your source document. And the reason for that is if you, if you don't balance at the end of your accounting, it could take you umpteen hours in order to find that error. And you cannot just put in a, what we call a fudge factor or my core, make it come out right number. For court accounting, you have to go back through and find the, the error. So check your numbers. Now I'm gonna switch screens here because I wanna show you a work of art. <laughs> in my view, where is it? It's this one. Okay, so let's go back up to the top. Okay, so we have so far talked about court accounting from the judicial council forms. And I mentioned that the GC 400 sum is a required court form. Um, there are other programs out. We um, have a spreadsheet that we sell for $50 on the court accounting and you get started on doing it on Excel. Um, it's in our non follow along uh, handout. But I wanted to show you what I consider a work of art, and that is this accounting report. <laughs> And this top page, summary of account, in order to turn it into the court, you would have to copy the numbers onto a GC 400 sum because that's required. But all of the other schedules, as I pointed out, were optional. And for someone learning court accounting, those forms are quite helpful because of the um, information on filling them out that it provides. But after you've been doing it a while, you may not need that information. And uh, this is a, the essence of a GC 400 sum. I would turn it in with a real court form on top of it. And then let's go through the details, which this method is sorted differently than all those schedules you went through. Now, a lot of it is the same. For example, this is the property on hand at the beginning of the account. So we mentioned the inventory and appraisal. So here it shows what the carry value was on your date of appointment when you got your letters. All of these assets were in the estate or trust. And this was the real estate appraised value for all the non-cash assets. And I do think it's a good idea to list the number of shares. It helps the reader get an idea. So this is basically, again, a copy job from your beginning inventory and appraisal, the date you got appointed or the date of your last account. Then we get into a series of disbursement schedules. Now, this particular schedule is chronological. 
from beginning to end. And it's not the only way that the expenses are being portrayed. It's one of two methods. So chronological, it lets the judge and any reader of the financial know what each of the transactions were. Okay, then we get into other receipts during period. Um, those transactions, I think I said it wrong, but they were receipts, not disbursements. Um, and these are the second categorization or income by category. And in this shows by vendor. So B of A, we've got Schwab one, and it allows the reader to get a better idea of what's going on from a vendor standpoint dividend income, IRA, interest. Um, generally, you wouldn't show IRA interest because it's within uh, an IRA pension. Um, and then miscellaneous receipts. Then we go into um, another type of gain. This is when you sold things, gain on sale of assets. And now we switch gears and go into the disbursements. And like the receipt section, our reports are showing it chronological. First, all the chronological expenses. Then it shows all the disbursements by category or by vendor. And so those two methods allow for easy um, review of your financial transactions. So we had up here was uh, disbursements like written by check or something else. And then we get into gains on sale. That would be you sold some securities or things. And in this case, we have an estate or a trust, and we have distributions to beneficiaries. Then the assets went down because of that. And then, like always, we have what is the property at the end of the account period, both cash and non-cash. Again, the cash is just reconciled to the date of the report. And the non-cash is your carry value. So to me, this report <laughs> is kind of weird, uh, is a work of art. It's, uh, it's not like you'd see in a, an art gallery, but it does the job um, if you like that kind of stuff. Um, another, so I'm gonna put this schedule away and bring up a different one. Now, this is another handout, it's too small right now. But I wanted to tell you what was in it, we're not gonna cover it, but it's a whole bunch of helpful things in my opinion that might benefit you. So I've listed where you can get forms, listed where you can get pleading paper if you need it. And also what we do is Microsoft Word has uh, templates to, to with pleading paper. Um, here is a how to do accounting from the Alameda County Superior Court. So it has sections on how to do accounting, the schedules, informational, it's brief, it's to the point, it gives you a list of common errors. And this is a cross-reference when you get into obscure transactions, this little cheat sheet is quite helpful because it'll give you the kind of financial transaction and what probate code section you would find the answer. So it's a nice little tool. And it hasn't been updated for quite a while. So 
the code sections may have changed somewhat. This is uh, an example of the spreadsheet uh, program that we make available um, that we sell for $50 and, and it shows the pages how the blank is filled out before you, you add any data in it. Okay, there's the for order form. And these are special in my view. And when you turn in court accounting or any petition to the probate court, you have these experts called probate examiners and they're like the eyes and ears for the judge. They review all documents and they make summaries of deficiencies. And one thing I recommend people do when they do their court accounting, and we've gotten approval from our local Contra Costa County Superior Court probate examiners, is let's say you got your accounting completed and you're not really certain that you did it right. Okay, and I'm talking about format. Well, our, you can go to the court and the, at the time when the probate examiners are available, it's usually during what they call their ex parte hours, and show the probate examiners your report and ask them if it's in the right format. Not that the numbers are right. They, you know, they won't give you, that's not the purpose of what we're trying to do here. It's just the format. Does the format of the way the pages are listed, does it look like that the format is somewhat close to being what it needs to be? So it's kind of like uh, getting a paper graded by a teacher. Um, but when you submit your documents to the court, then they go through it with a fine tooth comb. And one of the tools that the probate examiners use is a checklist and the local probate examiners have given me copies of their checklist. And this is helpful when you're turning in court papers to look at it and see what they're gonna look at. So a statement, does, is there a bond? Fair market value of assets? Um, is there a declaration? Um, here's for conservatorship. Has the petition been verified under penalty of perjury? Has notice been given to the Veterans Affairs? So what you can do is you can hopefully find errors before the probate examiners do and correct them by use of these spreadsheets. And they're cryptic, I realize that, but they do have code sections. So accounting on a state administration. So that means a probate, talks about notice to franchise tax board, the victim's compensation board, and they're gonna go down the list and make sure that your documents have all this in there. So. This might be helpful to you. Okay, Rex, real quick, another yeah. question we have here. We have actually about 15 more minutes before we end. So um, to all of the participants, if you have questions now, go ahead and type them into the Q&A. But uh, Bill Heyman wants to know, um, what happens when you're dealing with an insolvent estate? Okay, and in solvent estate, you have to look at whether you're going to be the executor or not. And sometimes it's better just to let the estate languish and not probate it. Um, the reason sometimes you can get an insolvent estate and you want to get the creditors wiped um, off of the uh, ability to collect, but it's going to be insolvent anyway. That happened fairly frequently after 2008 when the housing prices dropped. And people would just look at the assets and what was involved in the probate. And if, it, if there was a legal reason to do the probate, 
than they would. The requirement to do a probate is that the assets being transferred to the beneficiaries exceed a value of $166,250. If your assets are less than that, you don't need a probate. Or if it's um, husband and wife, one of the spouses died, you don't need a probate. You could use a spousal property petition. And if the assets being transferred is less than $166,250, you can use what we call uh, uh, 13100, it's a probate code section, a uh, 13100 declaration that uh, an affidavit and have it notarized that you're the person in charge of it. And if the bank or whoever doesn't give you the assets, they have to pay the legal fees to release the assets. So each situation is different. There is not a canned answer to that with an insolvent estate. Okay, and the follow-up to that um, from Bill is what if you get into the estate not knowing it's insolvent and you find out in the middle of it? Huh. It's called getting stuck is what it's called. <laughs> because you cannot just walk away and say, I don't want to play this game anymore. Um, you have been appointed by the court and it's going to take the court to get you off that case. So um, better a little forethought. Um, in an insolvent estate, um, let's say there was a house with a mortgage, was the house was worth uh, 800,000 and it had a mortgage for 1.2 million. Okay, I'd say that's kind of insolvent. Well, as the executor or trustee, you could deed that house to the lender. Say it's, it's called deed in lieu of foreclosure and we've done them. You just give the house out to whoever's got the secured lien and it, it's their problem. Um, another would be to, to go through a trustee sale. Um, but it one thing with an insolvent estate, when you get done, first of all, the attorney and the probate uh, the executor are not going to get any compensation for all the work they've done because it's based on the value of the estate. Um, but it is a good way to clear out uh, claims from creditors. So okay. maybe the short answer would be just panic. <laughs> You're stuck right. on this case. No, no more questions for right now. Okay. So I was gonna cover a few things more. You have to turn in original bank statements to the court, not copies. And if you get your statements printed from online, we have clients go and get them stamped by the bank. And there's a new law that you can file a, a declaration under penalty of perjury that those were original bank statements. but you have to put the regular court masthead on your stack of bank statements in order for them to be submitted to the court. So that's one point. Now I'm gonna go back to try to find, oh, lucky guess. This is the form that we did not cover originally. It's called the inventory and appraisal. And as we discussed, after your letters, you've been appointed as conservator or executor, you have nine, uh, 90 days to get this filed. And when you file your, you have list in whether you're pro per, who the attorney is, list the court, your case number, whether it's a decedent's estate, conservator, minor, or a uh, trust, and inventory and appraisal. We're assuming this is on a probate. Well, it says conservative. I'll change that back to what it says. So inventory and appraisal, you turn in within 90 days, and it says final, 
because you're not intending to do anymore. This is your one and only ever time you're going to have to do this. When your court papers are given to you from the court, there will be a rubber stamp usually that says your probate referee is this person. And a probate referee is an independent business person who appraises all non-cash assets for the probate court. And I like using them even with IRS kind of transactions because it comes out on court papers. But um, you have to appraise all assets that are cash type, which means reconciling. So how do we fill out this form? What you do is you just fill out the basic part of it, which is the masthead and the court, and you leave the non-cash assets, you give the form to the probate referee. So this is, I'm gonna skip this for now. This is the cash assets, but you give the probate referee that form and then they will fill out an appraisal on all of the non-cash assets, the mutual funds, the uh, real property, and then the probate examiner will sign the form and give it back to you, listing the total non-cash. And then it's your responsibility to tell the court, what are all the cash assets? And then you have one line for cash assets, one for appraised assets, and then a total. Um, there's other parts of this form that it's all the report and it says, was there a property tax certificate? Um, this is a form when somebody dies that you have to notify the county assessor that they may have a property to reassess. So it's a form filed and then you mark off that you have filed it. Um, if you're pro per and filling this out, you just list your name as conservator. And if you have an attorney, they'll sign the bottom part of it. But this other section has to do with the bond. And our court won't usually allow a probate until uh, without having some minimal amount of uh, bond, which is an insurance company that protects the estate assets in case they're um, misappropriated. And what I suggest people to do with when you're uh, putting your, your, your inventory and appraisal in is get your bond to cover all the liquid assets you likely are not gonna have the right to sell real property in this context. And if you've already got a bond for the cash or liquid assets, then the court would more likely approve it and they were, they were gonna hand, make you do this anyway. So if you get a bond ahead of time, it saves, saves time and effort. Okay, so now I want to cover, not that one, let me get to this one. Okay, this is just a quick, quick, quick overview of a report or a petition to the court turning in your accounting and explaining what went on during the period of accounting. So you'll say when you got appointed, you got your letters, your inventory and appraisal with these headings, uh, explain the period of account, what kind of investments, you can never put money in risky assets, sold some property, you tell the judge that, um, that you added a bond to cover and affiliate relationships you, the court always makes you write out whether you, let's say you're the uh, executor and you hire your son or 
a relative to do work for the, the real property. Well, you have to disclose it and then you have to prove up that you did not pay them more than a third party provider would have paid for that service. But this has to be in all of the petitions, otherwise the court will make you change it. So here's about compensation. As I said, you only get paid after this is approved. Same with the attorneys, only get paid after it's approved by the judge. And they require certain notice. They call them the 9303 notices, the probate code for if they had veteran benefits, if they were in a state hospital, um, if they, the victim's uh, compensation board, um, a lot of different notices that have to be given. Um, you have to put the conservatee's address. And the other thing that has to be done is you have to have a photograph of the conservatee every year. And I consider that because say if somebody's got Alzheimer's and they get lost and they're wandering around, you would have a photograph to be able to help identify. So original bank statements are turned in. Uh, you report on capital changes, report on the li uh, liabilities, and then your prayer of what you would like the judge to do. And on every petition, must, must, must have a verification under penalties of perjury. So that is what we call a petition. Some people call it a report. It's two things. One is it is a cover letter for your accounting asking for it to be approved. The other is asking the judge for permission to pay the conservator and the, and the attorney and uh, a disclosure to the beneficiaries and the court on all the transactions during the account period. So that pretty much wraps up the uh, overview I could spend another four or five hours, but I don't think anybody wants to at this point. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. Does anyone else have any questions? No, right now, wrap it up? there are no questions in the Q&A. Um, no hands raised. Um, if you guys want, to, if you have a question and instead of typing it in, you want to go ahead and speak, go ahead and raise your hand and we will turn on your audio. Yeah, the other thing um, I'll point out is I have no problem with uh, LDAs calling the office or contact information there um, or sending us an email and I get questions a lot of times. Some are easy to answer, some are a little more complicated. But uh, our contact information is uh, phone number 925-934-6320. And my email is Rex Crandell, that's D-E-L-L, -L, at astound.net, A-S-T-O-U-N-D.net. And uh, one of our six websites is rexcrandell.com. So. Okay, Zakia has her hand up. Um, go ahead. Zakia, unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I was, uh, I wanted to find out, do you recommend like any workshops or is there any training programs to be trained on the final accounting portion? Any training classes to be trained more thoroughly on this? Yes. I have never seen one. I knew there was a need for it. I talked to the local judge and got our class set up we, oh, uh, we do give a, uh, a three hour class every other month. And here's the information on that. If you wanted a screenshot, it's through the Contra Costa County Public Law Library. It's free and okay. contact information there. Um, my material, I did my part today my assistant, Tamara Brown, who also teaches it with me, she covers the other parts in more detail. But I don't know of anything. That's why I created the class. We've got all these people that are pro-per and need accounting and nobody's teaching it. So I am. But I don't know of anybody else. 
Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Zakia. Um, any anyone else? Questions? Nope. No other questions, Rex. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks for attending. Bye. Right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.